Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you open the scriptures to us and communicate your mind in simple, plain language as Jesus would have done if he were physically present teaching us. Take the glory in Jesus' name. So in the book of Acts chapter 1, what we see here is a capacity building forum that Jesus put together to equip the functionaries that will be saddled with the responsibility of extending the frontiers of the kingdom of God. The Bible says the former treatise, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach what to do and to teach. Uh, you will, meanwhile, the former treatise he was talking about because the author of the book of Acts happens to be Dr. Luke. So the former treatise he was talking about is the book of Luke. And the summary of the book of Luke is that which Jesus began both to do and to teach. So what exactly is this doing that Dr. Luke speaks about, because that doing is the foundation of his teaching ministry. Uh, that was the reason why his teaching was with authority. That was the reason why his father backed up the things he said in public ministry. If you study the book of Luke, which is the former treatise, uh, I because of time, we may not need to go into all of those dynamics. But what Jesus did for 30 years that his teaching ministry was predicated upon was a life of obedience to his father. Now, he had one decade of obedience to one year of teaching. Because there were 30 years of acute synchronization with the government of heaven. And that was what his teaching ministry was founded upon. That is the reason why there was so much potency in his spoken ministry. Meanwhile, that's not, this is supposed to be a background uh, to unveil to us how that the model of Adam revealed the principle of rebellion and the model of Jesus revealed the principle of obedience as the New Testament position of alignment with the government of heaven. And there is an emphasis of obedience in this scripture. That is the theme of the entire education that Jesus wants to administer to the functionaries that will be saddled with kingdom responsibility. Um, I don't know if we practice obedience as an intentional, an intentional act because what we received on the strength of our faith in Jesus, our salvation that we received on the strength of our faith in Jesus, we maximize its capacity when we decide to subscribe to daily obedience. If we have not yet practiced obedience as a fundamental culture, It will be impossible for God to use us as in instruments to manifest his glory. So this is what I did. Because we need to be very practical in a conference like this. So I, I realized through Bible study that I cannot get by without a deliberate commitment to obeying God. Obeying God as... He is revealed in his word and obeying God as he witnesses through his spirit. So I woke up in the morning. I prayed a prayer. I said, today I want to obey you. 
Then I stepped out. That was the, one of the most terrible days of my life. Because before I got back home, I'd insulted people. I'd, the flesh had manifested in so many places. I was better off before I prayed that prayer. Are you, are you still following what I'm talking about? So when I came back, I apologized to God. I repented. And I prayed again the next morning. I want to obey you. The next day was not too different from the first day. All the powers of the flesh were made manifest. But as I continued asking him to give me the grace to obey him, after like six months, some form of alignment, some form of harmony was beginning to be achieved. If you don't take the issue of obeying God as an intentional thing, <laughs> you will never gain the mileage that you need to, to be trusted with several kingdom utensils. Well, that's not... This is, that is the theme of this lecture that Jesus... Oh, we need to read sufficiently to prove that the idea of the book of Acts chapter 1 is capacity build. Functionaries that are going to be saddled with kingdom responsibility have to be trained. The former three times have I made of your philosophy that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the disciples whom he had chosen. Hallelujah. Well, let's do verse 3 and, and establish that it was education that the entire chapter 1 was about. He said, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There was a grand emphasis in his deliverables. The, the center of his delivery was about the kingdom of God. It was not about financial breakthrough. Because it was not Adam's post that got lost in the Garden of Eden. It was his hope of participating in the kingdom of God that got lost on the strength of his rebellion when he declared independence against God. So the Bible says that for 40 days, this capacity building forum was to equip. He was seen of them 40 days and the emphasis that he brought to them were things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So that's where I got that seminar from, the education from. But you see, most of you did not notice in verse 2 how that the kind of education that Jesus gave them is not a normal um, information dissemination arrangement. The Bible says that in this education, he gave commandments unto the apostles that he had chosen. I know you have never been to any secular lecture where you were giving commandments, but this, this is a strange kind of lecture. He gave commandments. It is only those people that he could command, people that are rooted in the way of obedience and alignment with God, that God had liberty because of their submission to command them. That it is only such that he showed himself alive to. To the rest of the folk, he was dead. But to people that could receive commandments from him, he was living, he was alive. And meanwhile, if he has not shown himself alive to you, you are not admitted into the education. I'm not talking about knowing that he's alive on the strength of theological effort. 
Because the Bible told us how he showed himself alive. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, not by doctrine. And I'm not saying that to undermine the place of doctrine. We are men of doctrine. But he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. He was seen of them <laughs> for 40 days. And in all these days, the subject of emphasis was about what? The kingdom of God. The rule of God. The dominion of God upon the face of the earth. That they will be saddled with the responsibility to steward that dominion. To colonize their localities and to enthrone the king called Jesus. That's radical. That's radical. But it is only those that he feels surrendered enough to him. For him to command. Now, when last did you receive a commandment in your finances? A commandment that is now sustained as a policy that drives your financial life. When last did you receive a command about your communion time? Don't pray by 6 o'clock anymore. Meet me by 2 a.m. Not a suggestion. If you have not been receiving commandments, it means that your life of obedience is questionable. That's why God doesn't want to embarrass himself by coming out to ask you to do something that he knows you will not do. If you see a man that works with God, his life is structured. The texture of that man's life is zoned to God. There is no variable you tweak in society that will affect him. It's like an oak. Because he's rooted into God in such a way that it's only when God moves that he moves. You know, Jesus, Jesus in one of those times in his ministry, he was opportune to reveal to us, like I showed us yesterday in the book of Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Now, the challenge with this, my delivery now, is that I, oh, that's my time. Ah, ah glory to God. <laughs> I've been looking for that. Okay. So, we'll, we'll just work with that. The challenge, and one of the things Jesus showed us in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, as I said yesterday, was he, he, he was attempting to reveal to us how man, according to the original conceptualization in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, was designed to function. We said yesterday that he's a creature of prayer. He survives by priesthood. His influence on earth is dependent on his ability to make earthly permission for heavenly interference. That's one. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, we see number 2. When Satan came and dropped a puzzle for him. That we'll be hearing you claim that you are son of God, son of God. We're hearing that title around but where I come from, we do not recognize that title. So if, if it is true that you are the son of God, we are not aware. You can confirm it by turning these stones to bread. I will now take the report of your action to my own station and intimate them that there's a, one, there's a new designation in the spirit. It's called son of God. And Jesus sees that opportunity to educate Satan. Say, I was there in the council in the beginning when the idea of man was conceived. And according to that conceptualization, man was not designed to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Indicative of the fact that you are, you are, you are supposed to be a creature that lives according to the proceeding word. If you don't have a diary where you have written things God told you, and you are leaving it, you have been traveling amiss. And that is suggestive of the fact that you do not qualify to be a carrier of the things that will promote his kingdom. 
You know, I wanted to continue from where I stopped yesterday. I, was, I just took my bath and I was trying to dress up and the Holy Ghost spoke. That's why I'm here. If we don't step up, the occultic preachers will take the stage. They will take the stage. You must have noticed, you must have noticed that they have gone on challenge for years. They will do anything to get endorsement from people that are leading ministers in the nation, on the continent, to extend their chef life of relevance. Man shall not live by bread alone. Man was created, man was designed to live by the proceeding word of God. I'm still trying to connect us to the fact that Jesus gave commandments unto the apostles that he had chosen. Men that have come to that point where they can live according to prescription, according to the proceeding word of God. God will not back up what he did not initiate. So we need to go to the fundamental issues if we are going to be carriers of God's power, God's authority. When last did he command you? When last did he restrain you? He intercepted you for six years and said you operate this way. And it doesn't make sense. And you have kept it because your heart is ahead of your head. So what he spoke about was concerning the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. How do we establish the kingdom of God? So that was what the lecture was about. But this lecture was not open to the public. Even though it is free, you need to qualify to attend. It's a free seminar. Free lecture. But you must have proven that you are foolish enough to receive commandments. You must have proven that you are foolish enough to function by the proceeding word of God. Are you there? Then, he will show himself alive to you. I'm talking about the living Jesus. That is the foundation for the life of faith. You know, it's possible for us to get involved in intellectual teaching of faith without living by faith. And I've seen it in a lot of quarters. People that will, will do all kinds of heinous things in the flesh just because they are afraid of believing God. Meanwhile, they are very eloquent in teaching faith. So faith is now a teaching. Meanwhile, our ancestors operated faith as a lifestyle. That's what we do because the God that we serve is alive to us. So it's not a risk to walk with him. Even though there is no physical, mental indication that the things that he has said are consistent with natural reality. You're going to have a problem believing God and taking giant steps in ministry if Jesus is not alive to you. Hallelujah. Okay, let me give you an instance. Our auditorium where I teach and preach in Benue State, which is my my jurisdiction was 250 member capacity for 14 years. I taught my life out. Hallelujah. Then I began to see 
I began to see snapshots of the mind of God. He was trying to take me outside of the box. And what he was showing me was massive. And I kept seeing what I saw for like four years. But I discovered that the problem I had was not that I did not see what God was saying. But I could not get my heart to believe it, even though I was fluent in the faith message. So, God had to take me on a training. I was on my knees in the morning when the Lord said, begin to build, because my wife is into uh, education, she has a school. So, he said, Go and build, build a school. So I had saved because I promised her when I was dating her that, yes, that school you spoke about, I will build it. Don't promise people quickly. <laughs> so I was on my knees when the Lord said, begin to build. And I had saved, you know, saved. So I now told her, I will build your school now. Uh, the money I saved because it was a two-story building. The money I saved could not bring the building from the ground. <laughs> I, I thought we were robbed, so I wanted to drive everybody out. They said, no, no, you are not. This, this is the breakdown. They, th that's how the foundation is. It's going up, so it has to go down. <laughs> I was a very analytical person and uh, I wanted, but that day I missed it because I made assumptions that were not accurate. And God was looking for an opportunity to put me in that spot where there was insufficiency. You will never know you need God until the obvious manifestation of your insufficiency finds expression. I know you've been, money, you've been shielding yourself from ever facing any form of insufficiency, but your faith training begins from there. Then the Lord began to give commandments. The remaining money you have, go and give this person. Then I obey. Then he opened something. Then we push it forward. It's okay. Now, now that it's remaining like this, go and give that person. That was how that place was built. So when that structure was built, I could now have confidence that God can do what he showed me for four or five years now. Now, you see, if you are not willing to receive commandments, your faith life will not grow. You are going to you are going to be pegged at a certain point for too long. So, the Lord empowered us and then we built a facility of 4,000. Well, from 250 to 4,000. So, the question is, who is going to come there? Because if 250 people enter into that place, the camera, there's no way you, you angulate the camera that... It, So when I said yesterday that we can fill this place in two weeks, I was, it's not, it wasn't a cliche. I was saying what I've seen. The greatest day for us as a ministry was COVID. It was during COVID we started that building. And for 15 months, we had raised a structure of 1.4 billion. And you know where I am now, in the desert. They, cannot, they, have, they have not paid salaries for four months, so I can't even... Meanwhile, that was the analysis. The economy was flat. Most businesses died. Are you willing to receive commandments? 
He gave commandments unto the apostles that he had chosen. If you are not in step with your own personal work with God, you are doing yourself great disfavor. All right. Let me, let me stop there. It is those that are willing to take commandments from him that he shows himself alive to. That is the foundation of your faith life. God had to preach to me one day. He said, if you claim you are a giant, then take giant steps. If you claim And that was the preaching that gave me the impetus to attempt. Jesus wants to increase your capacity. He wants to give you more influence over the city that in which you are domiciled. But he needs to show himself alive to you. And that's what admits you into the Seminar. All right, let's look carefully at the book of Acts chapter 1 and find with an, with, with an eye to trace the items that stood out in the lecture that Jesus gave to the apostles of the next generation. So we now know that the theme of Acts 1 is obedience. Because he will give commandments to those that he has chosen. And then he now shows himself what? Alive to them. Are you there? And that is what qualifies you to be admitted in the apostolic school. One of the first things he unveiled, which is very visible in this scripture which is where we stop, out of four things that stand out. One of them is from verse 6 to 8. He said, when the therefore were come together, they had a break. And uh, the issue about that led to the break was when he spoke about divine timing, which is not the emphasis. So, they, were, they, they, they asked for a break. So when they were back from the break, this was the question that they asked him, a political question. Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Then he responds by saying, it is not for you to know the times all the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. The word times is chronos. The word seasons is kairos. You know, in Greek, there are two words for time. We have the chronological time, which is the chronos time. Then we have the kairos time, which is the opportune time. And just in case, in secondary school, you went to a boarding school, dining was by 6 p.m. in the evening. For any reason why you are not at the dining hall by 6 p.m., that will be the reason why you do not have food that night. Because it is a kairos time. When the Bible says redeeming the time, it is not the chronos. It is that opportune time that must be redeemed because demons will contend with you to steal that window. Meanwhile, that's not where we are going. One of the things that Jesus raised in that apostolic conference was that you cannot do this business without a spiritual investment. I hope you know you can't serve God except you have a gift. God will need to give you a gift in order for you to be able to serve him acceptably. So Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is a critical component of apostolic takeover. 
If you are acquainted with the Old Testament, you will know that nobody ever becomes king until he's anointed. And the moment you are anointed, it means that you are a warden over a certain territory. And that's why we cannot separate the anointing from territory. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses then territory. If you, if the anointing of God has settled on your life, it means that there is a territory that it was designed to conquer. That is God's, God's, God's commitment to you is in the anointing. The moment it rests on you, there's territory in view that must be influenced, that must be colonized. And if that is not the case, it means we have underutilized spiritual capital. I know you know we are men of the book, men of the Bible, that there are four Greek words for power. And uh, attempting to condense Greek to English language subjected so many bright truths, cut off so many bright truths. So many times we need to launch an, a linguistic investigation in order to recover truths that are tied to linguistics. And we also, I know we know that that word is dunamis. I need to define dunamis to us because it has two meanings. Are you with me? Now, what we are talking about here is spirit and power. The, the shape in which the spiritual capital comes upon your life is, is a form of spirit investment. One of the products that can become the outcome of the utilization of the spiritual capital is power. That's one product. Are you there? Now, the word dunamis means inherent ability. Inherent. Inherent ability. Just like, is this, is this a Samsung? Just like, This is a Samsung phone. It runs on an Android operating system. And if you are going to get applications that run on this phone, you need to go to Google Store to download from Google. The moment it is downloaded to your phone, you don't need to take permission from Google to run the application because it is now inherent. So what God did is that he installed that investment, that spiritual capital, as an inherent utility Investment. You know why he did that? Oh, no. You are not following me. This, I'm talking about power. You know why he did that? He did that because he wants to transfer the responsibility of usage to you. Just like you don't go to Google to take permission to use an application that is installed on your phone. You don't go to God to take permission to use the inherent investment that is in your spirit, is one with your spirit. Are you with me? Now, they, mm. so for instance, if you pray for 30 minutes a day, what God will do is that he will, he will generate a supernatural program that is consistent with 30 minutes of investment. That is the extent to which you will experience the supernatural. No, it, 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 it's with the measure that you meet out that will be meted back to you. So you are responsible for your current spiritual texture. This is what you desired. This is how you desired yourself. It's not God's fault. It's your fault. Oh, if you decide to go on six hours per day, mm, the heavens will assimilate your investment and will deploy a supernatural state of existence that is consistent with your investment. Because it is what? Inherent. That's the first definition of dunamis. He has transferred the responsibility to you. Secondly, dunamis means potential energy. It is in a potential state. It is not useful in its potential state. So Jesus can be in a boat and the boat can sink. Mm, you are not following me. Potential deliverance is in that boat. 
Jesus can, can sleep in your life. That's what I'm saying. And snore. Whoa. There is a potential investment that can be awoken to come up. Huh? But many people allow Jesus to sleep in their vessel. And that's not his fault. Because dunamis means potential. Everything that God wants to give you is in the person of the Holy Spirit that is in you. But the fact that you have the Holy Spirit does not naturally translate to being able to tap into the resource base and to profit from his presence. That's not the same thing. Are you there? So that's why in this scripture he's saying, because it's the scripture the Lord said I should sit on in this session. In this scripture he's saying, you received spiritual capital and power is one of the tributaries that can be deployed from that investment. Is that clear? All right, so. In my years, sorry, let me tap into my experience in the oil industry. You know, for most of my life, I was, I was there. So, I understand scriptures by the oil industry. The moment you come to the oil industry, they will show you crude oil in the bottle. That you must see it. They will shake it. So that even in your dream, if you see crude oil, you identify it. And you know what crude oil is? It's a complex mixture of hydrocarbons. It's, it's, it's uh, a warehouse of value, but it is in crude state and it's not useful in the crude state. It must be, that is the definition of dunamis, a, a compendium of value. That is a potential, not necessarily useful, in the potential state, in the crude state. It needs to be subject to refinement. So when we say a refinery, what we are saying is a fractional distillation column for those that did elementary sciences. So you introduce it into a fractional distillation column and you introduce temperature. All right? When you introduce temperature and begin to manipulate the temperature, the first product that is going to come out of the refinery, they'll be coming out with respect to weight. So the first product that will come out is the associated gases. You need to trap them. LPG, heating gas. It will, as it comes, you, you trap it into the gas chamber. Even those fine products are still complex mixtures. So we have 18 parameters that we subject them to. If it falls within the range, it means we can call it this product. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So you increase the temperature. By the time you begin to heat 90 degrees Celsius, then the first liquid will come out of the complex mixture, which is aviation turbine kerosene, the kerosene that is used to power jet engines. Are you there? You increase it again, the next thing you are going to have is the premium motor spirit, which is what we call petrol. In fact, the super will come first. And then the downgraded one, the regular, which is the one they sell. They don't sell super anymore. If your car is uh, 2018 and above, you should, you should be using super. The chef, like the lifespan, yeah, of that car, the car will last. But this regular is downgraded. May the Lord give you understanding. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then after that, you now have the automotive gas oil, which we call diesel. Then it begins to heavier products, heavier products, heavier products. Then you have things like bitumen, things like asphalt. From one complex mixture. So there are a there are a range of possible outcomes that can come out of that same complex mixture. It's it just telling you that power is just one of the strands. Power is one strand, one product. Are you still understanding what I'm talking about? Okay. Hallelujah. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Apostle Paul reveals to us that there is only one gift we receive from the Holy Ghost that we can operate at will. Only one. Every other gift 
that comes from the Holy Spirit is operated when the Holy Spirit wills to operate it. Now, this is how the gifts of the Spirit are. The gifts of the Spirit, they are installations that you will need the Holy Ghost himself to come and operate. If, it's not the, if he doesn't come to operate it, it will lie fallow, to lie dormant. But there's only one gift he gives you that you can operate at will. And that is, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that is the ability to speak in tongues. For Paul says that I will speak, I will pray in the spirit. And I will pray, will, will pray in my understanding also. So that's the refinery, the ability to speak in tongues. It will interest you to know that a typical refinery is supposed to run for 25 years before they turn around maintenance. They turn around maintenance in our budget every year. Amen. <laughs> May the Lord give you understanding. It's supposed to run for 25 years. That means... There's supposed to be production going on for 25 years. If you want to adjust the parameters, maybe after 25 years you adjust. You check your output. If you don't like it, then you do turn around. By attending a, an apostolic conference like this, this turn around, turn around, the, so that the places that are rusted, you change quickly. Turn around. So let us ask you, in the last 25 years, what has been your input in the refinery? Because if we want to see power as a product come out, wisdom can come out of that place. Direction can come out of that place. All the bounties that are available to us in Christ Jesus are locked up in that complex mixture. It is the use of the refinery that will determine the product. And you know what? If you are dealing with ancient devils and your refinery is only producing gases. You can, it's not heavy enough to displace them. Now, I, hallelujah. Gas. That's where some people stopped. Gas. And you want to displace something that is an everlasting door. There's no solid. Your, your refinery is not producing solid. No weight. When you come, just release gas. That was how a man, a professor went to the village and got a maid to help his pregnant wife. And then something happened and he slapped the lady. The lady is the chief of witches in the village at, at, at the age of 12. Slapped the lady. The lady went and casted a spell. The prof died. Died in the morning. Then the man called pastors, called pastors, called pastors. Meanwhile, the lady had gone to her own mentor in the village, spiritually. That, and the mentor said, no, that's not how we use this power. Go and release the man. So she came back to release the man from death. But before she got back, the pastors had come and their prayers was producing smoke. Smoke. And because the smoke was there, she couldn't penetrate to raise the man from the dead. And the pastor's prayer was smoky. He couldn't raise the man from the dead. That's how the man died. Don't, please help me tell your neighbor, don't carry this smoke around. The smoke. The smoke could not solve the problem and the smoke prevented. Ah! People are carrying gases. Gases. So solid things can't move. The princes in your territory that have been installed by Satan cannot shake. Because all we have are gases. But so that you will not stop your mission on gases, he gives you an appetizer by saying the power can come out of the refinery. Solid products can come out. To use that one as, as a reference point in your adventure. But well, a lot of us have decided to stay at the gas lane. And that's why things can stand around your life. You'll be doing something like prayer, but it is not shifting it. The gas level. This morning, 
the Lord will help us to migrate from the gaseous level. Gaseous level. Gaseous level. That's where I found the 10 hour prayer. That's where I, I came about it. A pastor came to me and said, an angel appeared to him that he is designed to follow me in ministry. I said, I've been waiting for you. Then when I said, let's go into the place of prayer. By the time we move for six hours, he has not come till today. <laughs> I'm still waiting for him. I don't deny his revelation. No, no, no. It's not from the devil. Did Satan will say, come, ah, come. Six hours, is, we are still waiting for him to come. Whenever you say lost in your vessel, it means Satan believes you are for sale. You're already on the shelf for sale. You are likely to take a decision under the influence of that passion that will marginalize your destiny. So people that know the truth, they know that when they are when there's anxiety, you can operate outside of the spirit. When there's loss, when there, those things, they fight it. And the way you fight it is by starving the flesh and stuffing the spirit. If you find a talkative that talks on television, talks on radio, talks, talks at home, put the person on three days dry fasting. After the third day, greet the person. Well done, no, the person will answer. <laughs> the person will answer. Every day is food that feeds the appetites, the capacities of the flesh. Starve it! So I end with two scriptures so that we can, we can climb. Let us see the, there is one verse of scripture that accounts for 30 years of John the Baptist's life. Luke chapter 1 verse 80. One verse of scripture accounts for 30 years of a man's life. Ah. Hallelujah. And the child grew and worked strong. How? In spirit. There were many ways, many orientations of growth that he would have sustained. He can work strong in the soul by attending Oxford University. And I'm not saying spirituality is a friend of mental slothfulness. I'm just saying intelligence is not divine direction. The capacity to analyze is not a proof of wisdom. Wisdom has its own source, has its own platform. And John the Baptist was aligned in such a way that it was his spirit that grew more. He worked strong. How? This was a summary of 40 years in the life of John. By the time he came out after 40 years, he decided to pioneer his ministry in the wilderness. Huh? You know, he would have moved to Lagos and moved to Abuja. He remained in the village. Do you realize that all of Judea will empty themselves to the wilderness in search of John? Because he had worked strong. In spirit, Jesus himself, in trying to reveal the immortal shape of the witness of John, said John the Baptist was a burning and a shining light. There is no way you will miss that light, even if it's far in the wilderness. He didn't change his location. And his being in the wilderness did not affect his ministry. He walked strong in spirit. How have you walked strong? What is strong? Is it your flesh that has gained experience over time? You are strong in the flesh. John works strong in spirit. Luke chapter 2 verse 40 is a summary of 12 years in the life of Jesus. And the child grew and worked strong. How? In spirit. And as he kept waxing strong in spirit, the Bible says this thing, see the product that came out of his refinery. 
he was filled with what? With wisdom. So the wisdom on his life was evident everywhere he went. And what? The grace of God was upon him. This was the product that was coming out of his refinery on the account of the fact that he worked strong in spirit. Now, let me... Ah, I don't have time. My time is almost spent. And I want us to... Hey, this is the summary. Then they now show us a snapshot of Jesus at the age of 12. And culture is affecting that text because you will need to be declared a man as a Jew. You will need to book an appointment during one of the feasts with the doctors of the law. All right, when you have studied the Torah sufficiently, so you book an appointment with the doctors of the law. And the doctors of the law can come and ask you questions from any part of the Torah. You should be able to confidently provide answers. That is when they will declare you a man. And if you are not declared a man, no man will give you his daughter to marry. Jesus signed up for the short course at 12. The rest of his family went home. Look, they didn't know where he was. And then when the nun came back to search for him, are you there? Give me that scripture. I have strayed into it so much and you may not believe it's in the Bible. So, so let's look for it. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, he went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned the child, Jesus started in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went to this journey and they sought him among their king's folk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass after three days that they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now, so the, when they found him, are you there? God delayed them such that the first person to be interviewed for the day was interviewed, he left. Second person, third person, fourth person. It was when Jesus sat for interview, that's when the parents discovered him. So because he was on the table, on the spotlight, they had to, they wanted to analyze what was going on. He had, he had registered. And the Bible, the Bible says, give me 46, 46, 46. And it came to pass after three days that they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the, of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Excuse me. The natural practice, the normal practice is that you come sit there and then the doctors will ask you questions. But in this case, the Bible says Jesus was hearing them and he was the one asking questions. That's not what it's supposed to be. Are you there? Good. So what happened was that Jesus was put on the spotlight. They asked him questions, he answered. Then when he was supposed to leave, he said, I have a question. So he now asked the doctors of the law a question. And the doctors of the law could not answer. So Jesus now provided the answers to the questions that he asked. This was a manifestation of the child grew and was strong in spirit and full of wisdom and what? And the grace of God was upon him. He confounded the doctors of the law at 12. God took him again and put him in the wilderness, in the cave. And then he manifested at 30. I, I don't have time to read those scriptures. When he manifested at 30 and he was accredited at John the Baptist baptismal service and heaven came and said, this one is my beloved son in whom I will please. Meanwhile, Satan had been looking for him since the time he was born, you know. He's been mingling with the crowd. He said, okay, Satan wants to meet you. So meet him in the wilderness. He's been looking for you. So go to the, he's coming. Just, are you there? So his first outing 
when he became of age, was to meet with the devil himself. And it will interest you to know that only three men in the entire Bible face Satan face to face. Uh, Job, Jesus, and Paul. Are you with me? It means that you need rank. You will need rank for Satan to take you as a personal challenge. For, for many people, the spirit of Lagos is enough to keep you. <laughs> you may not need to meet Satan himself. Hallelujah. Say, go and meet him. See, he had the products coming from his refinery, they were hard enough to displace the entity that was the everlasting door. It will also interest you to know that Jesus arrived at the arena of testing before the tester. 40 days before the tester and decided to, to fast. He was not going to the wilderness to fast. He was going there to be tempted. It was him that advised himself fast. Now, you got into marriage and you were already in South Africa doing honeymoon. You, you didn't prepare for the tester. Oh, you were not aware that the serpent will come into your garden. No spiritual preparation. And the spirit that got into your union from that time has, has followed you till old age. You see what Hallelujah. The civilization you sustain is the one you create. And he works strong in spirit. We are going to pray in the Holy Ghost for a few minutes. He works strong in spirit. He was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto the Israel of God. <laughs> his location was not a factor. He could stay in the wilderness. And when the time came for his showing forth, the wilderness became a pool. Even if you travel through the valley of Baca, you can make it a pool if your spirit works strong. And if you don't have strength in your spirit, you can be put in the heart of, of Victoria Island and you'll be lost. Can we pray in the spirit for a moment? I have 10 minutes. What is the state of your refinery? What is the state of your refinery? What is the state of your refinery? Osia feli mantora bakaseli. Meso se la kila braska felamo santalia. Pila compre su filia compatula en zila mahabatua. What is the state of your refinery? Meofila mise canto beliza. There are men among us that were supposed to be born in light, born in light, having light and heat at the same time. Esu fela bodi akabe la isale. Bremo Santoria, Pika Seliba, Candeborias Caminat. Ailo Mohoro Sico Bresco Filam, Rabo Santoria, Pacaseli, Avaito Peli Nasukebama, Rapatosa Canteli, Esia Combe la Curia Bessima. 
What is the state of your refinery? What are the products flowing out of your engagement? Is your spirit waxing strong? Are you waxing strong in the spirit? Are you waxing strong? Are you waxing strong? Are you waxing strong? Is there strength coming? Is there strength coming? Through your spirit. Oh my God. What happened to your spiritual exercises? What happened to your night engagement, your night watches? Eso se. Rico mansale bo coria paquito se. Ebri ala babon samina cardia mansala. Combe si cobras que tamando boro is amelia cabesanta baboria. Abrisco Fantalia, Esquito Bresco Manteli Monde, Amancaya Tosa Lico, Ebrisco Fantala Babondiate Salibontela Busca Peto Pila Casi, Abrande Coria Babamina Santo. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus.